Good morning, everyone. Um, my name's Phil Anderson. I'm the General Manager of Policy and Professionalism at the AFA. Uh, I'm very excited today to introduce you to the latest webinar titled Leveraging Behavioural Insights to Increase Client Engagement, which is brought to you by our partnership with Deakin University, who are one of our education partners. I'm actually joined by an international speaker today, Dr. Campbell Hegan, who comes to us from Canada. He's a senior lecturer in, behavior, in financial behavior and decision-making at the Deakin Business School, and is a leader and advocate in working to integrate behavioral science into financial planning education. He has over 10 years experience in higher education, encompassing all aspects of course design and delivery, at the undergraduate and postgraduate level for online, campus located and blended student cohorts. Campbell's research interests focus on the behaviour in, of individuals and organisations, including what motivates us and how we make decisions. In today's webinar, you'll learn how behavioural insights can be leveraged to redesign financial advice processes and to increase client engagement and retention. You'll be introduced to two key behavioural design frameworks, which you can use to identify and mitigate frictions in the financial planning process and help design your conversations and business processes for behavioural changes. Now, before we begin, I'd just like to cover off some of the webinar housekeeping matters. So as a webinar attendee, you're on, on mute during the webinar. We've allowed for some time at the end of the webinar to answer your questions. Please use the Zoom QA feature, not the chat feature, as you can see in the diagram uh, at the bottom of the page. Today's webinar will be recorded and available on demand from the AFA website. Campbell, thanks for putting uh, this important information together and to help our members. Let's kick off. So over to Campbell in, uh, in Canada. All right, thank you very much, Phil. Um, I think that's the first time I've been identified as an international speaker, which is uh, slightly odd to me, as you'll gather quite quickly, I am obviously an Australian. Um, I'd like to thank Phil and the AFA for inviting me to speak to you all today. Uh, when we were discussing potential topics for this session, I was given a fairly broad scope of something to do with behavioural finance. Um, but given the growing popularity of the field of behavioural finance, I'm, I'm aware that this is becoming an increasingly common topic. So I wanted to ensure that I was adding some incremental value and hopefully exposing you to some new concepts and ideas which you haven't necessarily explored before. I also wanted the session to be of immediate practical value to you. So these two key points, novelty and practical value, were the main guiding principles. Now, I think most of you will agree that an important aspect of client management is setting appropriate expectations. So I want to start off by briefly outlining what you can and can't expect from this session. So this graphic is a, a fairly impressive attempt to classify and generalize the 200 or more behavioral biases currently listed on Wikipedia. And, and while I think that list represents a fairly impressive body of research, I think that the graphic is also useful and that identifies how many of these apparent biases are not necessarily unique but rather are often just the symptoms of more general factors which may affect judgment and decision making. So whilst it's certainly useful to have an understanding of some of the prominent behavioural biases and their likely effect on financial decision making, I think that trying to overcome individual biases is often a bit like trying to treat the symptom rather than the underlying cause. So what this session is hopefully about uh, first, I'm not an expert in the sense that I've not been studying behavioral science my whole life. My induction to human judgment and decision making came around six or seven years ago while we were reviewing the financial planning coursework at Deakin. So we identified at the time that traditional curriculum was largely concerned with developing students' technical skills and that there was an opportunity to add additional value by examining some of the behavioral and relationship aspects of financial advice basically what you do every day. So while the early version of the courses I created included a, a brief introduction around behavioral finance, 
we received a lot of positive feedback from students and current advisors over the years and this has led me to increase that focus and my own knowledge over time so i guess as of today i would not consider myself an expert but rather someone who has a keen interest in financial behavior and decision making and how we can use that knowledge to improve individuals financial outcomes My second observation is that anecdotal evidence and personal experience does not equal science. So in recent years, I've noticed a significant increase in the number of behavioral experts speaking at industry conferences, PD days and the like. And I've also seen an increase in the number of self-published books emerging in the field. And while many of these speakers and authors are informative and, and entertaining in their own way, I'm often left with the feeling that much of their content is based on little more than anecdotal evidence and personal experience. Now, in the field of behavioral science, we know that relying on anecdotal evidence and personal experience alone can lead to serious errors in judgment and decision making. So what I want to try to do today is to present an evidence based approach to employing behavioral insights in your practice. In doing so, I also want to acknowledge that behavioral finance is a somewhat narrow field and there's a much broader and equally informative body of knowledge in the mainstream behavioral and cognitive sciences, which can also help to inform our practice. So with this in mind, my main goal for today is to introduce you to two behavioral design frameworks, which can be used to help simplify the often complex behavioral theories and make it easier for you to apply these concepts in practice. I also want to provide you with an example of how you can utilize behavioral insights when working with your clients and we'll be drawing on the new FDS and annual opt in requirements to identify some relevant factors worth considering. So why should we consider a behavioral approach to financial planning? Um, look, when it comes to managing our finances, to be fair, we're often our own worst enemy. Oftentimes we suffer from what's known as present bias, as self-control issues, meaning we often make decisions and pursue behaviors which make us feel good, even if they aren't necessarily aligned with our long-term interests. Um, it can be tempting to spend now and, and reward ourselves for our hard work rather than save for our future. It's also easy to put everything off and avoid making any decisions at all. In other words, we procrastinate. After all, why not put off until tomorrow something which doesn't need to be done until next week or next month or not at all without hard deadlines or a strong call to action often the easiest thing to do is to stick with the status quo and simply do nothing at all we also have a tendency towards herd behavior and the fear of missing out or fomo it can tempt us to chase the latest trend at the expense of reasoned long-term strategies we can be tempted to want what's working now rather than what has always worked and I think the excess returns around cryptocurrencies and companies like Tesla and the short lived hyped around uh, GameStop serve as recent examples of this type of behavior. We also have a tendency to make decisions based on instant gratification rather than long term benefit. So human motivation is highly influenced by how imminent the reward is perceived to be, meaning that the further away the reward is, the more you discount its value. Now, from an evolutionary perspective, we're hardwired to prefer immediate smaller rewards rather than larger long term rewards. And this makes it all the more difficult to commit to long term savings goals linked to uncertain futures and fuzzy future behaviors. Um, finally, we have a tendency to trust our own opinions rather than hard evidence. And this means that we're not particularly good at taking advice unless it aligns with our intrinsic values and beliefs. So intuitively, we know that saving money for the future is a good thing, but our desire for material goods and, and spending on services often overrides our otherwise good intentions. Most of us know what we should be doing to improve our finances and save more for our future. So what's the barrier? Um, understanding why our behavior is so hard to control is actually quite simple. It's, it's a lack of self-discipline driven by psychological or environmental factors which influence our financial decision making. Unfortunately, while it might be simple to identify the problem, the solutions are often much harder to come by. Researchers identified that simply telling people what to do and educating them about their finances doesn't actually correlate with financial behavior change. 
Now, it's worth noting that this research is based on consumer finance and doesn't necessarily apply in an advice setting, but there are other factors at play which cannot necessarily be controlled for. What this research does tell us, however, is that while our relative level of financial literacy and financial capabilities are contributors to our downstream financial behaviours, there are broader psychological and environmental factors which can influence and indeed impede our sound financial decision making. So what does this mean for you? It means that financial advisors should be spending much more time on behavioural nudges and environmental changes than teaching our clients about how to improve and manage their finances. So behavioural insights is about understanding and changing behaviour and ultimately as financial advisors that's our goal too, to help people get from where they are to where they want to be. And as much as that involves the technical aspects, products, strategic solutions, all of these are relevant. It's also about an individual's behavior and to an extent, compliance with the advice provided. That is helping clients change their behaviors and enabling them to implement your good advice. Now, one thing that I do wanna to touch on before we go any deeper is um, the, the ethics of influence. So I want to be very clear from the outset that none of what I'm discussing here today should be interpreted or used in such a way that it encourages people to change their behaviour or change their decisions in ways which go against their own free will. The client must already have a desire or need to fulfil. It's the job of the financial advisor to make it as easy as possible to achieve that goal, empowering them to make positive, conscious decisions across their journey. So I'm not talking about changing decisions and behaviours to suit the advisor's interest. What we're really trying to achieve here is enabling our clients, and we do that by identifying factors or context which may be impeding them from making the changes that they ultimately want to make. So you're helping and nudging them along their journey, not changing their path with persuasion. So at the outset, I said that I was going to share two behavioural design frameworks, which can be used to help simplify the often complex behavioural theories and make it easier to apply these concepts in practice. So the first of these two frameworks, which I'm going to introduce to you, is the three B's framework developed by Irrational Labs. And a little later in the session, we'll go through the probably more known and, and popular EAST framework, which was developed by the UK Behavioural Insights team. So the field of behavioural insights draws on a very broad body of theory and it's difficult to know which little nugget or specific concept to apply in a given situation. So for this reason, designing behavioural interventions can be quite a daunting task and identifying all of the relevant factors which may affect behavioural change is difficult, particularly in complex situations. So the three B's framework uh, was developed by a US consulting firm, Irrational Labs, to help design interventions for behavioural change. So the behavioural framework outlines the three most important steps to design for behavioural change, identifying key behaviours, removing barriers and amplifying benefits. Now the basic premise here is rather than start with the theory and try to apply it in practice, let's just start with the problem and see if we can solve it. And it's that approach which obviously makes it so much easier to apply in the real world and why I think these types of frameworks are particularly useful for practitioners as well as academics. So the first step obviously is to identify our key behaviour. Now our key behaviour must be a specific and measurable action that you want your client to take. So if we think about what a specific and measurable action might look like, a behaviour such as I want my client to spend less and save more for the future, it's far too broad. Um, even something like I want my clients to put aside X amount of money per annum towards their savings goals is still too broad for the purposes of a framework like this. Our key behaviour might be something as simple as completing a form, returning a piece of paperwork, signing a particular document or opening a particular account. These are the types of small individual steps and processes which exist within a much larger ecosystem of individual decisions and actions, which are necessary for your client to complete in order to implement your advice. So the idea here then is to identify each of these sequential steps that a client must take 
and then refine each step in the process to make it as efficient and simple as possible for our clients to complete. So ask yourself, what action do you want the client to take? Now, this action might be the next immediate essential step in the process or a bottleneck in the advice process, which is preventing you from moving forward. Secondly, is this the single most important behavior for them to do to meet their goals? If not, what should they be doing first? How often do you want the client to do this behavior? So some behaviors only need to happen once, uh, but others require habitual engagement. So a behavior that only needs to happen once might be completing a piece of paperwork or signing a document and returning it to your office. Uh, habitual engagement could be something more like savings or putting money aside on a regular basis. The next step then is to focus on the barriers. We want to identify the roadblocks that prevent our clients from undertaking the desired behavior. So these are the extra steps, the hard questions, the frictions that prevent our clients from taking action or making sustained progress. So again, let's, let's think about some examples of what we're talking about here. Now, barriers in the financial planning process can be big, like accessing and filling out long forms to apply for insurance or social security benefits. But they can also be much smaller, like remembering your login and password for an online portal. Every click, every field, every signature, every step, every phone call adds friction to the financial planning process and slows down your client's progress. So this is where we need to consciously take a look at the financial planning process that we currently adopt or whatever specific action or behavior that you want to encourage and try to reduce the number of steps required as much as possible such that it becomes as effortless as possible for your clients to achieve their goals. In other words, how can we simplify the process as much as humanly possible in order to create what's known as the path of least resistance and make it as easy as possible for your clients to complete the tasks they need to complete? In addition, having to think or, or making a decision um, can also be a barrier. The more you can reduce this barrier, the better. So this idea refers to what's known as the paradox of choice. And sometimes when we have too many options or too much choice, we struggle to make a choice at all. Also factors like decision fatigue and choice overload mean we often struggle when making difficult back-to-back -back decisions. So we need to be conscious to spread those out over time. Now, given the number of individual decisions which need to be made as part of a comprehensive financial planning process, anything you can do to alleviate decision fatigue and reduce this barrier through simplifying choice sets is likely to be beneficial for encouraging engagement and ultimately action. The third B then is amplifying benefits. Now, benefits encourage and motivate our clients to do our key behavior. This requires thinking about what we can use to encourage our clients to change their behavior today in a measurable and realistic way, rather than procrastinating and putting it off until later, which is what most of us have a tendency to do. So to design for behavioral change, we need to either amplify existing benefits or create new benefits. So to create new benefits, you want to think about the key behaviors, long-term benefits, which we can more make more immediately salient and obvious to them today. Um, it's worth noting that where barriers add friction, benefits add motivation. In both cases, we want to focus on creating immediate and hedonic or emotional benefits. So what would make an impact to the client's life right now rather than in some future distant time horizon? Does the benefit appeal to someone's emotion? We know that if benefits are emotional in nature, people are more likely to react and engage. Um, it's also worth noting that benefits don't always need to be literal like monetary items or, or goods. There are also psychological benefits like fitting in and following social norms, 
uh, feeling good about yourself, such as altruism, and feeling good about the way that others perceive you, such as our reputation. Now, often these are stronger than more tangible benefits and can be much more effective in the long term, whereas economic benefits tend to be uh, less effective. So we'll go through some of these in a bit more detail when we discuss the second framework shortly. Um, but for now, what I'd like to do is provide an example of how we can apply this 3Ds framework to uh, the fee disclosure statements and opt-in annual consent. Um, so first thing I wanted to touch on is it's worth noting how the introduction of annual consent requirements has effectively switched the default. Now, in a behavioral science setting, uh, a default is a course of action that is taken when no choice is made. So the most common example that you would all be familiar with is the my super default option, which is an intentionally designed default option for those who do not exercise choice of fund. Now, previously, ongoing fees were usually levied under an opt out model. So that is the default model was that fees were deducted under an assumed ongoing arrangement unless the client actively changed or terminated the arrangement. That is, they had to formally opt out of advice. Now, under the new rules, clients will be required to opt in on an annual basis and make the conscious decision to continue the current engagement terms or request a modification. That is the new default is that the advice relationship is terminated unless the client takes action. Now, this is an important point and it's something that I want you to think about for a moment. Given what we know about the power of defaults, our tendency to procrastinate and our general reluctance to think or make a choice unless we have to, this changes the potential to impact, uh, sorry, this change has the potential to impact client retention in ways which were not necessarily intended. My personal concern is that this new requirement may have the um, effect that due to the additional effort required for an otherwise happy and satisfied client to opt in each year, even if that effort appears minimal to an outsider, there may be unintended consequences with potential to increase efficiencies in the advice process and in turn increase the barriers to advice. So let's have a look at what we can do to identify and as far as possible reduce those barriers. So looking at our three B's, behavior, barriers and benefits. In this particular scenario, I'd say our key behavior is for our client to provide informed and timely consent to the charge of ongoing fees. What are our barriers? Well, we know that consent must be in form of a written consent and a, a signature. So any steps involved to sign and return the written consent form, and this is something that we need to sit down and diagnose in terms of the full process required, all of these individual steps are potential barriers to your clients taking action. The second major barrier would be procrastination. Um, we know that we have a tendency to put off uh, any actionable item that doesn't require our immediate attention. Uh, so this is the other element that I think we need to have a bit of a look at. In terms of the benefits, um, I think for me, the benefits are, are clear. Ongoing fees equals ongoing advice. And from my perspective, I have no questions that good advice is worth the fees that you charge. But I think we also need to be very, very mindful because of the uh, regulated nature of these disclosures that we need to be ensuring that we are highlighting the upside of continuing the arrangement rather than just focusing on the disclosure requirements required by ASIC. So we're going to touch on that as well. So the following summary of the new requirements is taken from the ASIC release and frequently asked questions dated Thursday, March 25th. So it's quite recent. Um, now, I would strongly encourage you to take independent steps to ensure that your fee disclosure statements and written consent procedures comply with the current ASIC requirements. In other words, to be clear, this is general advice only. So what do we know? We know that uh, relevant providers will be required to provide an FDS no later than 60 days after the anniversary day for the fee arrangement. Uh, we know that the amount and frequency of each ongoing fee that the client will be required to pay must be included in that disclosure. Uh, obviously, there should be information about the services that the client will be entitled to receive, and I think you should be highlighting these. Uh, there'll be some 
information around a termination statement as well as a statement that the renewal period is 120 days beginning on the anniversary day. So I think if we just look at a couple of those items there, now there's obviously more that is required and ASIC has provided a, a pro forma consent form that you could use as an example. Um, I'd be being very, very mindful of using positive language and frames when describing the service being provided. So uh, information about the services that the client will be entitled to receive for me is a, a really important element of that consent process to ensure that client is basically fully informed on the full range of services that they're entitled to receive and that they are getting value for money. Now we know with a lot of the tangible aspects of our advice, this can be quite easy to quantify or relatively easier to quantify compared to some of the intangibles such as behavioral coaching. Now, the research says that behavioral coaching adds a lot of value to your clients' lives, but being one of the more difficult items to quantify, it's quite challenging to list it as a line item on an invoice. So this is where I think we need to be mindful of the types of language and the way that we communicate our value proposition and indeed our ongoing value proposition to our current and future clients. Um, I'd also avoid highlighting the 120 day grace period. So whilst you do have to put in a statement there around when the arrangement will cease if they don't provide consent, I'd be trying to include a strong call to action to deter clients from procrastinating and encourage them to complete that, um, that form and, and have it returned to your office as soon as practical. Um, so the ASIC FAQ says that you can combine the fee disclosure statement and written consent into a single document. Now this makes complete sense to me because we want to avoid choice overload and replication of effort. Simplify, simplify, simplify. Uh, make it as easy as possible for your client to provide informed consent and uh, where possible, unless there's a rational reason otherwise, uh, I can't see why you would not combine those two into a single document and reduce the overall administrative burden. Um, the only requirement is that both are worded in clear, concise, effective manner. Honestly, if it's not worded in a clear, concise and effective manner, your client won't understand it. They won't take action. They won't sign on again. They'll defer it and think about it for another day. So it's in your best interest to make sure that these are clear as possible, such that your clients readily understand what they're committing to. Now, this one for me is perhaps the most important nugget that I pulled out of the ASIC FAQ. So it states that you can seek written consent electronically, i.e. via email or secure web page, and that the client can also sign electronically or provide consent in different electronic ways. Now, my, my main piece of advice would be wherever practical, you should try to deliver this in person. No one likes receiving a bill in the mail. And if you're anything like me, when you do get bills or any type of paperwork that you don't want to deal with, it goes on the corner of the desk and it stays there until the last minute. And that's when I deal with it. I think if you can deliver it during your annual reviews, when it's clear the value you're providing to your clients, you're much, likely going, much more likely going to get a positive reception and clients are more likely to want to take action and continue that arrangement. Um, as far as possible, I would avoid regular mail or at minimum, if you are posting these out to clients, you should be including a paid returned envelope. Quite simply, finding a stamp is a barrier, finding a post box is a barrier, finding the time in our lives to actually post a letter. And I don't know about you, but I do maybe two or three times a year is all barriers that add to the process and delay the time it takes for your clients to return that document to you. Now, I understand for a lot of your clients, they're accustomed to dealing with hard copy and paperwork and, and um, the postal service. And if that's the case, that's fine. But if your clients are familiar with and capable for uh, electronic forms of consent, I think it would be much more efficient and there are less steps involved for them to sign back on. So I think this idea of um, using a, a secure web page or electronic forms, which can be easily returned via email, probably has the lowest level of inherent barriers to the advice process. Um, so ASIC provides an example here. And again, best you clarify this um, with your own dealer groups in terms of what you can and can't do. But to quote them, they say, for example, the account holder could tick a box on a website in response to a statement such as, 
By ticking this box, you consent to the charging of ongoing fees that are set out in this document. From all the options that I can think of so far, and you might have some others, that is the easiest path of least resistance option that you can provide to your clients, provided you don't overcomplicate it further. So if you are going to use any form of online system or electronic forms, where possible, avoid using new applications or software for electronic signing, which requires a client to create a new username and password, because that's another unnecessary barrier. As far as practical, integrate with existing technology that your clients are already familiar with and already know how to use, and it'll make it much easier for them to sign back on to your good advice. So I'm happy to take some questions about that at the end of the session. For now, what I wanted to do for the rest of the time I have today is to briefly introduce the EAST framework which was developed by the UK's Behavioural Insights team. Uh, the Behavioural Insight team was the world's first governmental institution dedicated to the application of behavioural sciences. Um, that was back in early 2012. So from our discussion of the three Bs, some of these elements are likely already familiar to you. Um, the EAST framework states that to change behaviour, the intervention must be easy, attractive, social and timely. But I think there's still value in discussing these alternative frameworks rather than just focusing on a single framework. For example, whereas the three Bs was primarily developed to assist with simplifying organisational processes and procedures, uh, EAST is more directed towards understanding and leveraging human motivation in order to make large scale policy initiatives more effective. Um, so the first letter, E, easy. If a decision requires minimal effort, it's more likely to be the one that's chosen. Basically, we want to create the path of least resistance to encourage wanted behavior and actually impose frictions and barriers to discourage unwanted behavior. So in some instances, frictions and barriers can actually be good when they prevent our clients from doing things which are not in their financial best interest. I think the classic example of that is the credit card in a cup of water stuck in the freezer for impulsive spenders. So how can we make things easy? I've already talked about the power of defaults. And we have a strong tendency to go with the default or preset option since it's easy to do so. So making the desired action the default option makes it more likely to be selected. The second thing we should consider about making things easy is to reduce the hassle factor of taking up a service. The effort required to perform an action often puts people off and starting the financial planning process, um, there's a lot involved. There's a lot of paperwork to complete. There's a lot of information to compile and it can be very off-putting for someone who wasn't necessarily prepared for that. Reducing the effort required can increase uptake and engagement and ultimately um, help foster longer term constructive engagements. A really important one I also want to touch on is about simplifying messages. So making a message clear often results in significant increase in engagement. And I sort of touched on this with FDS, but I think it's worth considering in all aspects of the financial advice process. Clear, concise information is extremely powerful. In particular, it's useful to identify how a complex, large goal can be broken down into a series of simpler, smaller, achievable actions. So this is something that we should really be focusing on, not just the advice, but how to implement that advice is what's important. So the second letter of East is A, attractive. Uh, basically, if something is attractive, we're drawn to it. Uh, we're more likely to do something that our attention is drawn towards and, and ways of doing this uh, include the use of images, color or personalization. Um, so attract attention. Now, this is increasingly being leveraged in fintech applications, for examples, where clean graphics and a focus on user experience is an essential part of the design process. Now, if you think for a moment about um, the increasing array of apps and mini games, which have been purposefully designed to consume our attention. If someone picked up one of your statements of advice in the street, not knowing what it was, how long do you think it would hold their attention before they went back to their phone? And this is ultimately what we're competing with when we're competing for an individual's attention. 
To make advice attractive, we need to design rewards and sanctions for maximum effect. So whilst financial incentives are often highly effective, alternative incentive designs also work well and, and often co cost less. So if we're thinking about a, a long-term engagement type behavior, um, such as a saving strategy or a budgeting strategy or something like that, that has multiple regular targets for clients to hit, build in cheat days and splurge spending opportunities on discretionary items as a reward, which are linked to measurable progress towards long-term goals and positive behaviors. Now, it's important that these rewards must actually be linked to a behavior that your client has control over, not something that they don't have control over, such as market, reward, uh, market returns, for example. So it shouldn't be linked to overall balances, but rather client behavior in order for those rewards to be effective. Uh, given our preference for immediate gratification over delayed gratification, break large long-term goals into a series of levels comprising multiple smaller short-term goals, which are easier to achieve. Uh, basically, this allows our clients to feel the joy of success sooner and more often as they work towards their larger goals. So the fourth letter then is social. Now we're all social beings and we care about what our peers are doing and what they think of us. So social norms are the values, actions and expectations of a particular society or group. And the concept of social proof, I guess to an extent, also explains why we rely on the opinions of strangers and the five-star rating system when we're deciding where to eat or which item to purchase when shopping online. If we think about the social effect on our day-to-day -day behavior, we can also see how that can be leveraged within an advice framework to encourage people to adopt better behaviors. So one way to do this is to show that most people perform the desired behavior. So use social proof to highlight and reinforce participation by describing what most people in a particular situation do. Now, we have to be mindful in not over exaggerating the facts here and stating that most people perform a behavior when they actually don't. Um, statements like many of my clients have had success with or common goals that many of my clients have uh, identified in the past uh, are much stronger in encouraging positive behavior because of the social element because these are your clients they belong to an identifiable group and therefore they are relatable and therefore we are more likely to be influenced by their behaviors as well um, on the converse side be mindful of negative framing so a common statistic that I hear is that one fifth or 20% of households access professional financial advice. Now this cracks actually creates a negative social norm and implies that most people don't need financial advice. So when using statistics and, and when talking in these terms, be very mindful of not unintentionally creating a negative impression of the behavior that you're actually trying to encourage. Um, Secondly, use the power of networks, and, and we know how powerful social networks have become in our day-to-day -day lives. We're embedded in a network of social relationships, and those that we come into contact with, either virtually or in person, shape our everyday actions. So one thing that you might want to consider, either virtually or, or in person, is creating a community of savers. Um, a group of individuals who are working towards their individual but common goals, supporting each other and sharing in each other's success. Now, this can actually also lead to a little bit of friendly rivalry as we try to outdo each other. And that competitive behavior, behavior can really act as a, an intrinsic motivator for certain personality types. So there's a lot of value in comparing individuals to their peers, both to normalize a behavior and to encourage them to excel. Uh, and again, an, another one is to encourage people to make a commitment to others. So there's often a, a gulf, this huge distance between what we state we want to do and what we actually end up doing. Now, we often recognize this gap ourselves between our intentions and our actions, and it's known as the intention behavior gap. And we often create these commitment devices that we use to voluntarily lock ourselves into doing something in advance. I think the frozen credit card is a good example of one that I mentioned earlier. However, making these commitments social often amplifies their effects. So the easiest way to raise the stakes is to make the commitment in public or to another person. Now, ideally, this person is someone who, whose respect 
you value. So making a commitment to the advisor, either written or orally, can have a big impact on client compliance and behavioural change. But it's going to be even more powerful if that commitment is made to friends or loved ones. So think about how we can leverage that and encourage people to make public commitments for the behavioural change that they ultimately want to make. The final element then of the EAST framework is timely. And what this tells us is that the time you choose to prompt or nudge someone towards a desired behaviour is vitally important. Now, we all respond differently to prompts depending on when they occur. What we need to do is think about prompting people to change when they're most likely to be receptive. Now, recommendations made at different times can have drastically different levels of engagement. Behaviour is generally easier to change when habits are already disrupted, such as around major life or I would say lifestyle events, such as being the impact on COVID on all of our day-to-day -day behaviours. Um, for example, we're particularly likely to change our habits during periods of transition. So after we move house, getting married, have a child or lose a close relative. Now, many of you will recognize it is often these transition periods which have uh, influenced potential clients to seek out professional advice in the first place. We also have what's known as the fresh start effect, which is one of the effects that explains why we're so inclined to make New Year's resolutions or set deadlines around milestone ages, such as um, you know, particularly rounded birthday numbers and things like that why people have bucket lists that they want to achieve by the time they're 40 50 or 60 for example so we can use these transition moments we can use these life milestones as triggers to prompt our clients to change unwanted behaviors and take more positive actions timeliness can also mean considering the immediate costs and benefits so as we've already mentioned, we are disproportionately more influenced by costs and benefits that take effect immediately rather than those that are delivered later. So this emphasis on short term at the expense of long term is the result of our present bias. And it comes about because the present is tangible, but the future is abstract and hypothetical and therefore much harder to grasp onto. So given that the present exerts so much influence on our choices, we need to be mindful of whether the immediate effect of the behaviour will be perceived as a gain or as a loss. Now, again, the framing of the language used to describe strategies can also be influential. For example, terms like salary packaging or pay yourself first, generally speaking, infer a positive frame whereas salary sacrificing and reducing take-home pay have negative connotations which infer an initial loss and are therefore going to be less attractive in the client's eyes. Um, another proven solution is to prompt people to identify the barriers to action and develop their own plan to address them. So basically, the best cure for what can go wrong in the advice process is to help people plan their response to foreseeable events. Now, this implementation intentions approach is successful because it recognises the power of situations which have potential to lead us astray from our goals. Advanced planning for these types of events also helps people to respond in the moment in a way that moves them closer to their goal rather than further from it. Given financial planning is a process, not an outcome, the success or failure of a given strategy lies in the details of how it will be implemented and how we will respond when things inevitably don't go to plan. And I think that's one of the most important take home points that I want you to take from this session is that planning for what can and will go wrong and discussing that in advance with your clients is oftentimes the most constructive and successful conversation you can have to ensure that any short term behavioral changes pan out in the long term. That's pretty much everything that I wanted to cover in today's session. Um, as we said, we have left some time for your questions and I'm quite happy to take those. Um, so perhaps I'll pass back over to Phil and um, see if we've had any takers. Yeah, thanks Campbell. Um, we, uh, we've had quite a bit of interest uh, and, and some uh, uh, good comments there. Look, can I uh, ask a question to start with? Um, do you take the same approach with all clients or tailor it to their level of 
um, motivation in, in setting this up? What's the best way to go about doing it? I mean, ideally, everything should be tailored to the individual, but I guess it depends on what we're talking about. I mean, if we're talking about, um, you know, the, the FDS and opt-in consent and things like that, you're going to have a fairly pro forma standard document and a fairly pro forma standard process. But if you're aware, for example, some clients prefer to deal with um, postal hard copies, whereas others are quite happy working online, then certainly you would try to customize the process where you can and work towards their initial preferences. Um, if you're talking about maintaining motivation over time, I think this has to be personalized and unique. And this is where the value of getting to know the clients, what their value triggers are, what their you know, intrinsic beliefs are, what motivates them to seek out advice in the first place and using that and echoing those beliefs and values back to them is probably going to more likely to encourage sustained behavioral change and positive action. Good. So it's about tailoring it to individual clients and the specific process that you're talking about. Uh, a question from Adam. Is it fair to assume that a great client questionnaire assists both advisor and clients to identify current behavioral traits Fair to assume that many uh, client questionnaires are not appropriate in the post hain RC world. Yeah, I, I'm highly critical of the, the pro forma hard copy fact find document in that they are really unintelligible to the average client and they set a really poor first example of what the financial advice process is actually about. Um, so I talk about this a lot in that I understand that these, these questionnaires are required in order to provide um, compliant advice and, and satisfy our requirements. So it is necessary that we perform these. But if you think of a generic fact find document that creates um, doubt in the client's mind, if they can't access the relevant information, they don't understand whether the questions apply to them. They, I don't know about you, but I don't like filling out paperwork and, and I'm not, not, not sure your clients do either, but this is just a barrier to engaging, isn't it? When you've got this monolithic document that you have to complete before the advice process starts. Um, I, I think Adam's suggestion that sort of curating the initial contact points such that it encourages the type of conversation and behavior that you want to encourage is gonna set your client off on a much more successful footing than these data-driven processes, which um, you know, really good at collecting numbers, but not very good at collecting the stories behind the numbers. Yeah, Campbell, it's interesting whether that question was about um, the fact find process or it's about um, regular interactions with clients to understand what they are valuing in the advice process, what they're valuing in their relationship with, the, uh, with their advisor. So yeah. I, I think, do you, do you want to? Look, I, I think the face-to-face -face human element of the advice process um, is, is irreplaceable and it's something that we need to be focusing most of our attention on rather than um, you know, some of the, the more quanti quantitative driven aspects that we do need to focus on. But certainly through experience and, and through the type of investigative interview techniques that help to reveal clients' priorities, whether they be open or hidden priorities that the client wasn't aware of, is certainly also going to help you and them self-discover potential barriers or problems that might crop up and, and prevent them from, um, you know, stepping forwards. A, a big part of that can be lines of questioning around your successes and failures um, in managing their finances in the past and provide that's done in a tactful way such that it's not, um, you know, pejorative and the client doesn't feel ashamed of their past behaviours. It can be very, very powerful in revealing, you know, potential um, weaknesses that they may be susceptible to that you can work together to overcome. Great. Um, Campbell, there's a, I guess what we've got is, uh, is quite a bit of interest now in, um, in the behavioural finance area. And Jennifer's asked the question, what are some research papers, books, podcasts on this topic that you've found the most interesting that you could recommend for further reading? And I'll leave that with you, but maybe what we can do is, is ask you to highlight a couple of things and, and we could then include that in communication 
afterwards to participants in the webinar? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot out there, um, a lot more than when I started developing coursework for Deakin. And I mean, it's been really gratifying to see uh, just behavioral finance being mentioned within industry press on a regular basis. And, and that, that tipping point is starting to happen. Um, in terms of books, podcasts and the likes, I mean, there's a lot. Um, I personally use social media as a listening device to basically put my ear out there and, and see what other experts in the field are talking about, what articles they're sharing, what they're reading. And I, I have a reading list that's as long as my arm that I'm probably never going to get to. But there's certainly a lot of books and, and a lot of, um, I, I guess you'd say, influential uh, individuals that have shaped my knowledge over the time. Uh, many of them are academics, but many of them are financial services professionals as well. So um, I'm, I'm certainly happy to put some thought to that and maybe put some re recommendations out as well. That'd be great. And another question from Jennifer, would you say that it is important to be able to identify a client's personality type uh, interaction style before being able to apply behavioural approach tools? Would you say they go hand in hand or are separate? Um, I, yes, I think it's important to have an understanding of the individual's uh, communication and decision-making preferences in order to better relate to them and to make them feel comfortable and to make them feel at ease. Um, at the moment, there's not a lot in terms of readily available diagnostic tools. And so we have to use our social engineering and our emotional intelligence to be able to better understand the client working across the table from us. So, you know, I think that's one of the skills that an experienced advisor accumulates over time is, is to put ourselves in the client's shoes and to better understand where they're coming from. And then that leads to the type of conversations which I guess are more revealing around behaviours and the likes. That said, there is a increase in focus in this area in the fintech space around the discovery process, mostly coming out of the UK, but in the US as well. And there are an increasing number of tools available, which whilst not necessarily um, appropriate in, in the Australian setting just yet, I think it's only a matter of time until we see some of the UK suitability tools, for example, um, transferring over and, and, and being relevant and usable in the Australian context as well. So I think watch this space because it's definitely an emerging area. Campbell, another question, uh, and this is a broad one. Is there a recommended software that, that will allow fees to be opted in? Now that might be a, a tough question for you. Yeah, look, I'm, I, I'm not aware of one at hand, um, mainly because I'm, I'm not fully across the capabilities of what the modern CRMs can do, quite simply. I mean, preferably if it's something that's integrated with the systems that you're already using, the financial planning software you're already using, the client portals that you're already using, whatever you have internal support and training, that would be preferred rather than a new piece of software that the client has to learn and um, adjust to. Now, ideally, the product providers, if they're listening, I think could take advantage of this opportunity and curate a ASIC compliant procedure that they could then roll out to your existing CRMs um, and then everybody wins. But for the moment, I think these could be created relatively easy by people who know what they're doing, but I'm not aware of any that already exist. And it may be that the, the best outcome is that some of the product providers um, deliver automated solutions for the collection of the consent forms that need to be ultimately provided to them anyway. So this is a, this is a I guess, somewhat separate from your presentation, but it's a space that we'll be watching with a great deal of interest over the next few months. Yeah. No, it's definitely um, it's one for the, the current fintech providers to work on and, and the current um, providers of client portals and, and things like that, be they super funds or, or wrap funds or whatever it might be. But those that already have the client facing portals um, could definitely integrate it into their existing platforms. Adams asked this question, fair to say that it is not always appropriate for advisors to share their own investment experiences with the client in the nudge process? 
depends if it makes them more relatable or not. I think we've all made mistakes. Um, I've shared my own experiences in the past and you know, significant losses I made in um, uh, around the September 11 attacks, for example, um, but then also the power of holding strong and recovering those losses over time rather than converting to cash. So I, I think there's no harm in sharing personal experiences and normalizing these behaviors. In fact, the more that we can normalize these behaviors, the more people are likely to understand the value of behavioral coaching and, and how a, a rational objective advisor can help them stick to the plan and stay on track. Um, so I think to the extent that it adds value, don't shy away from it. But um, it, again, it shouldn't be done in a way that makes a client feel embarrassed or ashamed about their own past poor financial decisions. Right, uh, Campbell, I guess in, in terms of an advisor who's come along and listened to your presentation and they're, they're thinking about how do I go back and apply that in my business? And I guess they've got to be thinking about the barriers in the processes that they put their clients through. You know, what's the best way for them to apply this in practice? Is it about thinking about each process and where the barriers are? Yeah, well, I think this is a really good opportunity to get everybody in the practice involved in a broader conversation. So whilst the advisor might be having the strategic conversations and, and the annual reviews with clients, you've got a lot of support staff in the office that are working day to day with clients, helping them to actually implement the advice. So if you ask them what's taking up the most of their time, what forms aren't being returned, what things are they currently following up with on clients, trying to get them to take action? I think these are obvious issues that you can save time with by trying to, to, to overcome some of those problems. Um, but I, I think it's definitely an opportunity for everyone to get involved in the conversation and say, well, what's not working? What's slowing things down? How could we redesign our, our existing processes to make them more engaging for clients, but also to make it easier and thereby speed up the process and allowing us to spend more time on more important activities? Yeah, a really good point that you make there about this is the whole team um, and, and the the people who are dealing with the, the complications uh, on a day-to-day -day basis are absolutely the right people to be uh, looking at the solutions. So another question from, uh, from Ashley, um, money and accountability coaching together with life coaching seems to be a growing business that doesn't require a financial planning license. Uh, I'm not sure that this is a question or a statement, but, but you are really introducing the issue of um, of behavioural change, which is such an important part of what financial advice is all about. And that does flow into a broader role that could come with life coaching. Yeah, I mean, it is going beyond what I'm talking about, but I think there's definitely complementary elements there. Um, I, I guess I'm not necessarily talking about going beyond licensed financial advice because I personally struggle to distinguish the two in terms of advice and behavioral coaching. And I, I think it, it makes sense um, for the two to work together, but uh, we are definitely seeing a separation to an extent. And we've seen this in the U S as well um, in terms of how that plays out in terms of individual responsibility, licensing requirements and, and education requirements, for example, um, I guess is yet to be seen. Right. One last question. Uh, is it Campbell's view that all clients can change their behaviour as a result of the so-called nudge or are there inevitably some clients that can't be helped in terms of behaviour change, e.g. leopards don't change their spots? Um, I think the vast majority can and it's just a matter of identifying the individual's triggers and what's important to them. Uh, it's fair to say that mass nudges will always have errors in the margins but a carefully curated personal approach, um, which is founded on a, a comprehensive personalized discovery process is much more likely to be effective than something that was developed at a, a high level governmental policy sub, um, scenario. So I, I think there's always going to be somebody who's too pig headed to change, but I think the vast majority of people could benefit in one form or another. Great, all right. So. 
Uh, to sum up, uh, today's webinar has been recorded and the presentation slides and the, the webinar will be available uh, on, on the AFA website. Uh, all registrants will receive an email confirming when this is available and also they will be uh, able to access the CPD points. Uh, Campbell, I'd like to thank you very much for your presentation today. Uh, some of the feedback reinforces the value that uh, our listeners have got from it. Um, tremendous guidance on how they can apply this in their everyday uh, business um, and the importance of leveraging behavioural insights into the way uh, they design their processes and how they interact with clients. Now, Deakin University is a, uh, an AFA partner. Uh, we, um, our members have access to discounted rates on the study, the graduate diploma study or, or other study that um, may be part of the FASIA requirements that our members are currently going through. So if you do have any questions about the courses available through Deakin, um, understanding those discounts, either have a look at our website or get in contact with Kaz Garrard uh, and you can use the, uh, the campus AFA at afa.asn.au email address. So uh, please reach out for that. Um, just to conclude, I'd like to thank all the listeners today for taking part, for registering and making themselves available. We appreciate your support in continuing to put these webinars together. So at that, um, I'd like to thank Campbell once again uh, and, and thank everyone else for uh, attending today. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you for having me.